So the next presentation by Professor uh, Katie Berner from Indiana University in Bloomington in Indiana in the US. Um, I think will give us a bit uh, an, an overview on the data mining, what people actually can then do with the data. So um, Professor Berner is a professor of information sciences and also an adjunct professor uh, in statistics. Um, she's a core faculty member of cognitive science, member of leadership team in network in the IU Network Science Institute. And also, uh, she's the leader of the Information Visualization Lab and the founding director of the Cyber Infrastructure for Network Science Center. So I think her presentation will focus on, on these elements on how to do data visualization, drawing actionable insights from science and technology data. So I'm looking forward to quite innovative approaches there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a true pleasure to be here. I'm learning a lot. And I hope I also can tell you a little bit about our work and about the research in what to do when you actually have a lot of high quality data. It was already mentioned that today we live in a very global world. Science, technology, innovation, all of those are global elements. And ultimately, we need to have access to all that global knowledge. And if we don't have access to it, then we might just spend our time reinventing. And we don't want to do that. So I will tell you a little bit more about how to take all that good data, take publications, patents, grants, clinical trials, social media data, we already mentioned altmetrics, and try to increase our understanding of how science, technology, innovation actually operate, and how data mining, big data mining, and small data mining and visualization can help to render some of this data into insights, into actionable insights. So on the left-hand side, you see some of the clients we have. Unfortunately, much of this data now is digitized. It comes in relational databases. It comes in triple stores. It comes as part of the linked open data. And I was really glad to see linked open data and the semantic web mentioned in some of the slides which we saw this morning. Ultimately, we need that black box in the middle to find our way through all that data to find collaborators, friends, but also to understand what the collaboration is, uh, what, what competition is doing and what collaborators are doing. Also to identify trends, to identify emerging areas of research, to stay competitive, to attract the best uh, expertise and to find efficient means to disseminate the good results we just gained. And so our teams have been working on tools that empower anyone from um, high school children to science policy makers to render some of these uh, scholarly data sets into insights. And in some cases, we also work with um, biomedical researchers. And there, it's not about getting a lot of citations. It's about having parents go home with their children, not without their children. These data mining and visualization tools are really needed in almost all areas of science and technology. And yes, good, having good data, having access to good data is a precondition of having good data mining and visualization results. And if you um, were listening to the talks this morning, the uh, Open Data Cloud and the Open Data Portal, these are the preconditions of the Innovation Accelerator uh, projects, which some of you might be familiar with. And I'm really looking forward to see that accelerator in action one day. If you take um, publication data here, for instance, um, publications from one conference in the area of information visualization, it's one out of three conferences. There are no journal publications covered here, no book publications. So it's a very limited data set. But still, you can take this one conference and you can extract leading authors and you render each one of them as a circle. And whenever they co-author with each other, you create a link between them. And as uh, time passes in these um, animated slides here, you will see how these collaboration networks form over time. Um, the size of the circle here represents the number of um, papers published. And the darkness of the node represents how many citations these uh, publications have gained. So what you want is a 
big circle, which is rather dark. And you see it's above those circles and uh, Ben Schneiderman, who is one of the uh, largest circles here in the lower left, and there must be uh, this one right here. You see that typically each university has exactly one information visualization expert. And this expert works with an incoming outgoing stream of students. And some of those students might get hired at other universities. And this is how typically these different universities interlink over time. It also happens that some key leading researchers here, in this case, three of them work all at the same uh, research institution here at Xerox Park for much of what this data set co covers. And then those three might connect in a much more intense way than what would be possible in a university setting. You also see that some of these networks are unconnected, and this is also because the data set captures only a certain time frame, so over time they might connect more. But it's also um, due to the fact that professors typically work with their grad students and uh, publish with them. And it could be very interesting to, for instance, render other areas of research, including toxicology and food safety, in a similar way to understand the evolution of the field, to understand key players, to understand the backbone of this field, and um, get an idea of how information diffuses via collaboration links. And obviously, you can render these kind of networks also based on citation data. You can then uh, take other data sets. Here are all collaborations by the Chinese Academy of Science. And as you know, there are uh, seven branches in total. And you can start mapping these connections globally using a base map of the world as a reference framework. And if you zoom into the um, main branch of the Chinese Academy of Science in Beijing, you see here at the country level how these uh, researchers are collaborating in a worldwide um, global manner. You can then bring in funding data and you can try to identify identify and understand the return on investment. And here we were engaged in a study with the National Institutes of Health, and they were interested to understand the difference in collaboration networks that result from two different types of funding. On the one hand, um, the smaller networks, which you see there, these are collaboration patterns coming out of R01, investigator-initiated research. So these are smaller research projects um, led by single investigator. And as you see, they do connect, but to only to a certain degree. On the right-hand side, you see um, funding that went to the T-Turk um, centers. So these are tobacco research centers. And thanks to a close collaboration with NIH, we here had comparable uh, data sets, um, which covered the same time frames, the same topic areas. And as you see, um, publications coming out of center funding are much more expensive, but this is also because centers have other missions to fulfill, including providing resources, including infrastructure, also uh, hosting workshops, um, serving as lighting towers for postdocs and uh, other researchers which might spend sabbaticals there. Uh, in another study, we tried to understand the global scientific food webs. This is using Thomson Reuters data. And um, you get to see how different countries are now um, actually becoming major players in the um, area of the number of publications, but also the number of citations. As you might know, China is very soon going to overtake US, not only in terms of number of publications, but also in the terms of the number of citations. And so it's interesting to understand in how far these different countries depend on each other, eat each other's uh, knowledge uh, by citing it in this case, using this metaphor, but also um, produce knowledge that can be consumed by others. I won't have time to go into details here, but I assume all these slides will be made available so that you can follow up on details if you're interested. And ultimately, you can again use a base map of the world to plot um, these activity patterns over time. I wanted to lead you over to um, other maps generated by some of my colleagues. And these maps are part of an effort to bring maps of science um, that show our collective scholarly knowledge, technology knowledge, our collective innovation potential to a larger audience. And this is captured in the Mapping Science exhibit. And actually, 10 of these 
now 100 maps are on display in the back of the room. So um, if you like maps and you want to see not just our spatial space in which we live and work, but also the innovation space, the knowledge space, um, which we have amassed over centuries, then you're very welcome to check out the maps in the back. Again, there are only 10 out of 100, but um, all of them are online, and you are welcome to check them out. In this particular map, you see how science is used. Um, it is generated based on usage data. Um, so the area of science, which is actually biomedical, here in uh, red on the left-hand side, um, is much larger because there are many doctors in doctors' offices which are desperate to find cures. And they might never publish a paper or cite a paper, but they download papers from Medline in order to understand how they could possibly help that child or other person in front of them. In the lower left um, corner, in the lower right corner, a um, little dark here, and again, I, these maps are made for a meter by 60 centimeters, or rather large formats, 300 dpi, which doesn't reproduce very well on the um, projector here. But this um, smaller um, map down here has the same um, base uh, layout, um, like the large map, but now um, the social sciences are colored in yellow and the hardcore sciences are colored in blue. And what you see here is that um, the social sciences actually interlink and interrelate the different um, hardcore sciences. So in order to get um, from one publication to the next, which is here indicated by the linkages, um, you oftentimes go through the social sciences, which then hold all the sciences together is a, I think, very nice metaphor for the value of social science in our lives. In uh, other maps, you will see phylomenies, uh, which um, basically are showing the different branches of research and how they contribute to overall uh, developments in science and technology. And again, in the um, large printouts, you would be able to read the text here. Uh, if you're interested in um, prosthetic sockets, it's perfect because um, this is exactly showing that line of research and how it um, resulted in major um, breakthrough results. But um, this technology is very general, so if you have a specific technology development that you would like to zoom into and study in more detail, you can contact um, David Chevalier's team in Paris and you can work with them. Ultimately, we are very interested to understand feedback cycles and delays in science. This is work by the Council for Chemical Research in the US. Um, and there are three thick reports behind that one map. Actually, the map made it as this yellow arrow graph on the right-hand side uh, to a congressional hearing, um, arguing that um, every year, uh, the federal government spends about one billion in federal funding uh, for uh, basic research in chemistry. Uh, it, it then takes um, four to five years to uh, complete that basic research. The uh, research funding is matched by chemical industry um, money, uh, which then um, supports and funds uh, invention development, which is another uh, nine to 11 years, and um, ultimately also um, commercialization of products, um, which is another five years and ultimately helps increase the chemical industry operating income, and then via growth on GNP and jobs created, uh, creates about eight billion in taxes, which then goes back to the federal government, and one billion again is invested in the next year. So the interesting part here is not only how these uh, co-funding circles work, but also the delays I just mentioned. So if you would like somebody to go from idea to product in two years, it's simply not feasible. There are delays in this system, and even though this is just representing delays in chemistry, I think there are also major delays in other systems. And it would be wonderful to have this study replicated, for instance, in food safety research, to see if the delays are similarly high or if there are other delays to be gained. And the methodology written up in these reports behind the map might be helpful for doing so. For those of you which uh, like science fiction and like maps, we have a special map, and um, this one is actually on display um, back uh, in, in the, on the back of the room. And here you can see um, some of the major books in, in science fiction literacy, and we hope um, you enjoy these maps as well. 
So there are maps of um, scholarly publications, but there are also other maps of human um, understanding and knowledge. Coming over to uh, social media data, as you might know, um, lots of um, tweets are um, also about science. Percentage-wise, maybe not so many, but um, there are some very interesting ones, and tweets can really help increase the delay we have in the system to get, for instance, from a successful clinical trial to uh, these new cures being used in doctor's offices. And so here you see a map uh, which just shows um, languages and how they are used across um, Europe in tweets. And I think it's very fascinating for me to see how um, active the Dutch are. And I think many of them, they're just tweeting on their bicycles while they're going. Um, also potentially relevant for your research here uh, is the healthmap.org um, predict. Um, this map uh, shows real-time data, including alerts, um, including access to data on uh, cases that has be, have been cited, including uh, information on how many animals um, were discovered with a certain disease, etc. And that could be a very good example of how to create a visual interfaces to toxicology data, for instance, or food safety uh, data. You might also uh, be aware that we are all much more connected, so uh, timeliness is, or has already been mentioned this morning. And I would like to highlight that um, it makes a difference um, when ideas or innovations break out. If it's right around Christmas, maybe not so many people will get to hear about it. If it's at another time, it might be better. Um, it has an impact if it starts spreading from a major um, city or if it just spreads from an urban area. Um, how infectious an idea is or how infectious a disease is makes huge um, difference in terms of spreading activity. And of course, also interventions, be it vaccines or be it ampli amplification by keynote speakers, for instance, makes huge difference. So we work very closely with epidemiologists because many of the models which have been developed in this area can be directly applied to the um, understanding of um, the spreading of ideas or technologies. I would also like to highlight this map because it actually allows multiple participants to allocate resources. Um, so it has a computational um, economic model behind, but in each round, um, multiple um, users can allocate resources globally. And in the next round, um, you see the state of the world based on these decision-making um, rules. And I think having these online simulations where people can envision possible futures, desirable futures, and then see how certain decisions play out in the long run is very important. So there are 100 maps, and um, again, 10 are in the background. Um, there's also the link here for exploring them online. If you ever get interested to um, bring 100 maps of science to your institution, this is how they arrive, big, big boxes. You will have people on speed dial you, dial you never knew existed. You will know the loading deck height of your building. Um, and um, if you don't want to do this, but still want to see all the maps, you could go in Chicago to um, the uh, Northwestern University Library. So it will be on display there for a little bit longer. They just extended it. Um, but we will also have the exhibit at the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, and some of you might be visiting there um, in the early part of next year. As part of the exhibit, you also have interactive, interactive displays. Here you have a large-scale uh, display of two maps, a map of the world and a map of science. And you have a touch panel, which you can use to select any area on the map of the world or on the map of science. And you will get to see who is conducting this kind of research. So if you have a pointy fingernail and you click on Harvard, you will get to see their footprint, their expertise profile on the map of science. If you have papers in Medline, you can enter your own name. And that's what many people do, because it's a reality check and a kind of, I want to see if this is uh, correctly reflecting my footprint in the map of science and in the map of um, the world. 
but you also um, can use buttons for more interdisciplinary research areas where you would have to hold down many fingers to capture really their um, relevance on a map of, of science. Uh, the exhibit travels very well in trains, if you um, happen to have um, a, a train station. Unfortunately, Bloomington, Indiana doesn't have a train station, but um, in Europe, there are many, many train stations, and it's a wonderful way to bring a lot of science to a lot of um, general audiences. Um, it's also coming as a screensaver, if you happen to have one of those large display walls. And uh, it also uh, goes to many science museums, so watch out for it. In the second phase, so this was the first 10 years of the exhibit, but the next 10 years of the exhibit invites researchers and practitioners and industry also from, and government from around the globe to submit interactive visual interfaces to science technology innovation data. And we hope that at some point um, you would consider also submitting. There are the iterations um, listed on the lower right and um, we just, um, we are now in the process of um, putting together the 11th iteration and this will be debuting in two months. As part of this effort, we have also started to uh, render what we call science forecasts. And this is very analogous to weather forecasts. So you have a very good looking woman or uh, a very handsome gentleman in front of a large map. And the map is not showing weather trends, but instead it's showing trends in science, technology, and innovation. And this work is driven out of the data sets that I mentioned before, papers, patents, grants, clinical trials, social media data. And I believe it can be used as a wonderful means to give um, a general audience a very good overview of what's happening in science and then to zoom in to very specific questions, zoom out again, uh, kind of foreshadowing the next episode. And so I would be very interested to provide more information on that effort as well. How many more minutes do I have? Okay. So I wanted to um, point out that open data and open code, so, so much of the um, visualizations um, visualization research you have just seen is using um, tools that can be um, used by anyone, that can be used for commercial purposes, um, that can be extended by anyone. And we want this because this um, tool development has been financed by the US taxpayer. And ultimately, we don't want to provide 24-7 service, but many of our um, uh, collaborators, which are smaller and larger companies, actually they want that kind of business and they should have it. Um, however, open data and open code goes very, very well with open education. And oftentimes you need a little bit of hand-holding in order to use a new data set or to use a new tool. And this is where MOOCs come in. This is where massively open online courses have a major role to play. And many companies have already started to embrace it to not only advertise their products, but also to empower the data muscle, if you wish, of many people. And we recently run a study across six science museums in the US trying to understand the data visualization literacy of those people that make it into science museums. So we interviewed a thousand youth and their caregivers um, to understand if they can read data visualizations, if they can name them, and to get a better baseline for uh, teaching data visualizations to many um, um, audiences. And one piece that seems to be urgently needed is to provide a kind of framework for helping people understand what tool to use when, how to treat certain types of data, and uh, what algorithms are meant for answering what kind of question. So here you see different types of analysis from uh, statistical analysis in the top left to uh, temporal analysis answering when questions to geospatial analytics answering where questions. So here you would actually go to geographers and cartographers to get the algorithms. Uh, you have topical analysis answering what questions. Um, so this is linguistic analysis. And you have network analysis, which is now done across the sciences. At Indiana University, we have 100 network science researchers just on one campus spread ar across 17 departments. Um, so many new algorithms in that area. 
you have also different levels. You have the individual level, you have the meso or institutional level or regional level, and then you have the global level. So this is typically where you have very large scale data sets and you oftentimes need to use parallel computing and, and lots of shared memory computers to um, run your analysis because some of these, uh, especially topical analysis and network analysis, they are quite uh, demanding in terms of processing power and uh, memory. And you can then use the um, 100 maps in the exhibit and you can put them in these different cells which you now have in this table. And of course there are many maps which um, touch or try to answer many questions such as the evolving network you saw in the very beginning of the presentation. So that would be trying to answer temporal and uh, topical and network um, questions. The IV MOOC, which is available to anyone, um, has seven sessions and then you have another eight weeks to work on client projects. And as you see, it very much follows um, along these different questions that people might have when they look at a data set. And in this course, um, we teach a very basic um, workflow design, and it really has to be simple, one, two, three, so that everybody can do it. And it's really everybody who should uh, be able to read and write data, because it's almost as important as to read and write text in today's, in today's time and age. So, how do we empower anyone to not only read data visualizations, but also to make them? And the argument we have here is that you have to make these visualizations in order to read them properly. And I hope many of you get inspired to actually download some of the tools and start reading in some of your own data and to make some of those visualizations. So you typically would read a CSV file, an Excel file, you would analyze um, this file, and then you would select a base map, you would overlay the data, you would visually encode that data, and then you would go back and look at it, and you might see, oh my god, I, I missed one year, or I really have to zoom into that area, or now I wanna do not just look at output, but I also wanna look at input to do a return on investment analysis. And you can have different types of base maps. Um, we also saw networks, we also saw um, bar graphs before. Um, ultimately, we hope that you will understand that you can load one file and you can run many different analysis and visualizations, but just pointing the tool to different um, columns in your um, Excel file. And I won't have time to go into details here, but the tools that are provided in the IV MOOC allow you to generate all of these different visualizations just by reading one uh, file here, a publication data set, and um, then running appropriate analysis and visualizing data. Um, the course also teaches you a more formal visualization framework that helps you to understand how to identify insight need types, how to deal with different data scale types, how to uh, properly select different visualization types, and then if you have additional data variables associated with your records, you might like to then use graphic symbol types and proper graphic variable types to encode that data. And ultimately, you might be interested to interact with the data, and so there are different types here as well. And so you can go into each one of those types and you will get to see all the work that has been going on when we try to understand how these um, different basic task types might be called and how they might be organized. And uh, starting with work by Patung in 1967 and going on also through some tool developments, you then get to see what kind of neat types are used here in the framework. Ultimately, you can take any two columns and tabulate them in another table, and then you get these um, large displays of um, here um, uh, geometric symbol types, such as point, line, or area, and um, graphic um, variable types, such as spatial types, which is just position, or uh, form or color coding in this case. And you can um, zoom out and you get even larger tables. And it's like a periodic table of elements where some elements have been tried and found and others have never been attempted before. And so we hope this also helps you understand the quite um, substantial space in which um, we can 
uh, depict and render data in new ways, um, but also gives you guidance in when to use what kind of encoding. So you're invited to um, become one of the many, many students um, attending this course, and you will be in the company of um, students from more than 100 countries, and um, many um, companies actually have started to bring entire teams into um, this course and many of the other courses that now exist online. This is not the only course which is teaching data visualization skills. If you're interested in more information, please feel free to ask me and please do have a look at the maps while they're on display here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> Some of these maps are not very informative. They're true artworks also. Um, are there any uh, immediate questions? Yes, please. Here in the front row. Good morning. My name is Nico van Belsen. I'm the Director General of International Dairy uh, Federation. Thank you for the fascinating talk, uh, Dr. Bermer. This is the last time I saw a beautiful graphics presentation since I left uh, microscopy. So thank you for that. Um, I have a question on quality control, not of the data, but of the analysis. Okay. Because as you indicated, there are many ways to analyze the data. And let me throw a scenario that may or may not be uh, uh, hypothetical, and that may be of interest also for the policy makers in the audience. And it is that an academic group uh, does, makes, does academic research on the toxicity of a chemical. They publish the data set. They draw the conclusion, well, there's not so much risk for public health. Now, an activist group takes the same data set, does a different analysis, and concludes there's a huge risk to public health, in which we should all stop eating food or whatever. Is there a way to have a quality control of the different analysis that the academic group did and the activist group did? Thank you. So as I mentioned in the very beginning, the tools we have been designing um, are open, so you can look at the code, you can expand them very easily. There is a wizard-driven process to add new algorithms into those tools, and everything you do with this tool is recorded, so there are rerunnable workflows. Ultimately, I think what we all, or what many of us want, are um, rerunnable papers. So if I review a paper, I actually would like to be able to rerun that analysis that somebody did. I would like to see the sensitivity of the algorithms for different parameter values. I might have a better uh, idea of, or I might like to uh, compare the analysis they did with a workflow that um, replaces one of the algorithms with, with my favorite algorithm and see how this analysis would play out then. If I like the workflow documented in the paper, I might like to feed in my own data and see what it does to my own data. So I think we have to get to an infrastructure where papers ultimately give us access to the data, but also give us access to the workflows. And ideally, ideally, and I think to a certain degree we have uh, managed to do this and to support this, makes it possible for me to add new algorithms on the fly, to add new data sets on the fly, rerun the entire workflow, and then understand if the result that's documented in that one paper is still correct. And this is really needed also for the review of these papers, not only after it's published, that you look at it then, but as part of the review process, it should be possible to rerun all of this. Um, I also mentioned in the presentation that it is important to empower anyone to not only read and write, but also to deal with data. And I, I'm serious about this. And this is um, important not only to achieve in the formal uh, training, in the formal education process, um, K through 12 education or college um, and, and graduate education, but it's also important to engage those which are not in the um, formal education system anymore. So that's why we collaborate very closely with science museums because that's another way to reach those which have left um, the school system. And of course, in some cases, the children or grandchildren might have to teach grandparents or parents how to actually have fun with these tools. And that's perfectly fine, I think. So I hope that answers your question. So I think empowering anyone to rerun, um, not only researchers, but also the general audience, um, is key to what you want. Thank you very much. One last quick question before we go on. 
where behind you? Hold. Thank you. I'll, I'm from China and um, I'm representing Ely Dairy. A very quick question, actually. Uh, you mentioned a lot of times about tools, mm -hmm. and I just wonder, as a company, where can we actually find those tools to already exercise a bit? Yeah, thank you. The um, Science of Science tool, which was funded by the National Science Foundation, um, is um, in GitHub, so you can get it there. It uses um, OSGI, the Open Service Gateway Initiative um, framework, to plug and play code, so it has a very um, um, industry strength core, and um, this core now also has been adopted by some other tools, Cytoscape, I'm not sure um, how many of you, you are familiar with that. Um, given this plug-and-play architecture, which is typically used in coffee machines, in cars, in, in copy machines, etc., we can now very quickly plug-and-play um, scientific code. And these might be data readers, these might be data analysis, data visualization to, um, algorithms. And some of those algorithms might be proprietary, so people might just use them in their own lab, but whenever they then want to get citation counts for that code, they can add it to the common good of all, all code uh, uh, available. And this way, whenever somebody runs that code, they would actually get to see whom to cite. So um, I would be happy to um, help you find it on GitHub if you can't find it. But if you look for the Cite2 tool, you would see it. Also, if you go into the IV MOOC, you will get to know this tool very well. Thank you very much again, Professor Berner, for this exciting presentation. And I encourage everybody to look into the tools and create some beautiful, colorful maps. <laughs>